Hello, everybody. I'm David Rubin at the University of Chicago. I'm in Chicago right now. And on behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled Bringing Ulcerative Colitis Clinical Decision Making into Focus for 2020, Identifying the Right Treatment for the Right Patient at the Right Time. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, which is an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians and all of our colleagues worldwide. Today's CME and CE activity is also eligible for the ABIM mock points. So make sure you engage in today's event, answer the polling questions, submit questions to us, which we will look forward to answering and provide your feedback. Once you complete today's program, be sure to provide your ABIM ID and birth date in your evaluation. CME Outfitters will then submit your mock points. I also want to encourage everyone to join us today on our live Twitter conversation at hashtag focus on UC, no spaces. We'll be monitoring the Twitter feed in real time and responding to your tweets as they come in. One last item I wanna note is that we are using an enhanced, enhanced platform today. For those of you who've done these live, you may be familiar with the iPads that we've used. Well, this is similar to that. You can save slides, take notes on slides, answer polling questions, and send us your questions. Please look at the tabs on the right of your screen and give us your feedback on the program as well as this platform. We really wanna continue improving programs in this new reality that we all live in. Again, my name is David Rubin. I'm at the University of Chicago and I'm joined today by my esteemed colleagues and very good friends. First, let me welcome Dr. Millie Long. Dr. Long is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and Director of the GI and Hepatology Fellowship Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Hi, Millie. Hi, David. Great. And let me also introduce Dr. Ajua Anyane Yeboa. Dr. Anyane Yeboa is an instructor of medicine at the Division of Gastroenterology at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. But Dr. Anyane Yeboa was also one of our fellows, and I'm so happy to see her career continue and to welcome her today as an expert for this program. Welcome, Ajua. Thanks, David. Super excited to be here. Great. Okay, well, let me review our learning objectives so that we're all on the same page. Our first learning objective is to compare the new AGA and ACG guideline recommendations on the treatment of ulcerative colitis in order to identify the appropriate course of action for individual patients. Our second learning objective is to differentiate targeted therapies for ulcerative colitis using efficacy, safety, and comparative effectiveness data from the clinical trials as well as the real world experience. And our third learning objective is to empower and educate patients to become an active part of shared decision making. So let's begin with our first two learning objectives and discuss the ACG and AGA guidelines as well as some of their differences. The ACG guideline actually came out in April 2019. The AGA guideline came out more recently in this year, and both um, have a variety of similarities uh, as well as some differences. Uh, before I get into some of the differences related to therapies, I'm gonna start at the bottom of the table just to show you that um, they both include hospitalized patients, although they talk a little bit about some different ranges of steroids, which are minor. Um, but the ACG guidelines also included updates regarding colorectal cancer prevention in our colitis patients. There were a couple other differences in therapies, however, specifically when the ACG guidelines came out, the tofacitinib label change had not occurred. And you may recall, or you may already know, that tofacitinib had a label change positioning it after exposure to anti-TNF agents, uh, and the AGA guideline came out after that adjustment had occurred, and they said that if you're going to use TOFA in patients who haven't been on anti-TNFs, they should be part of a research protocol or study otherwise. The second change was that um, in the ACG guideline, we emphasized that the three anti-TNF agents were available as first-line therapies in naive patients or betalizumab, and in the AGA guideline, they said that infliximab or vedolizumab would be used rather than the injectable anti-TNFs, adalimumab or golimumab. The other one is just related to infliximab-exposed patients. The ACG guideline mentioned veto or TOFA, uh, 
And USTA wasn't available at the time of that guideline, but got approved subsequently. So in the AGA guideline, they say that USTA or TOFA rather than VITA or adalimumab were preferred after infliximab exposure. And we'll get into some of these details as a group tonight to try and clarify how we can make sense of all this. And of course, I know you're all sitting at home thinking, um, well, what about payers and how are they going to influence what we do and what we think? And I think that's a compelling question and important issue that we'll be talking about while we go through this. So with that introduction, it's really my pleasure to hand over the podium, so to speak, to Millie, <laughs> who's gonna walk us through a case and we'll talk a little bit about how we might manage it and she's gonna teach us a bit about the evidence. Millie? Wonderful. And so I, I will start with a case. And I think this is how all of us learn best because we really do try to keep that patient centered focus. And so this first case is Ada. Ada is a 27 year old South Asian woman who presents with weight loss. She's lost about 10% of her body weight and she's been having diarrhea. She describes this as six bowel movements per day during the day. Uh, and about half of these have blood. She is experiencing urgency and cramping um, prior to having a bowel movement that's relieved when she passes the bowel movement. And so initially um, you do some workup. Um, obviously we're going to check for C. diff, um, which was negative. Uh, she had, did have a fecal calprotectin, which came in at 183. And at the time of an endoscopy, uh, she had what was Mayo 2 uh, inflammation. And I'd like you to look at the photo over on the right one of the things I've found very useful in my practice is uh, grading the in endoscopy. And here you can see that while she doesn't have spontaneous bleeding, she has ulcerations, loss of vas vascular pattern, a lot, you can, you can see the friability. And so this is a Mayo score of two. So and when you kind of Millie, dig can in- I just ask you about this first? Sure, yeah, go ahead. In, in your endoscopy reports, do you actually write Mayo scores? I do. And the reason I find this incredibly important is that not only can you assess how severe the patient is right now, but it becomes an important yardstick when you're reassessing that patient. Because one of the things that I really do in my practice is try to understand after I have initiated a, a, a treatment and, and the patient hopefully has responded, I really want to reassess and ensure that things have healed. And so if I know where they started, it helps me to understand where they're going to. And so I would really encourage you to use this in your practice. It's very simple. And many of the uh, softwares, we use probation at our place, but it actually has it pre-programmed and even describes what each scale is. All right. My second question before I let you keep going is okay. do you routinely benchmark with a calprotectin in ulcerative colitis patients when you scope them? So I think this is very useful. Um, it depends a little bit on your payer base um, in that in certain areas of the country, fecal cal is less covered. But one reason why this was included in the guidelines, we have the evidence basis behind it, is that it should be garnering more support for your payers. And so if in the past you hadn't been able to use it because it wasn't reimbursed, I would encourage you to try again because it is supported by guidelines. But being able to link that endo the, the endoscopic component to the fecal calprotectin is very important. So you know if during a flare, for example, what their range of fecal calprotectin is. Right, and so for our colleagues out there, it's the ACG guidelines that include Calpro if you need something to back up how you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And the other pearl is just include diarrhea when you're ordering the Calpro right. in addition to colitis because the diarrhea is the label for calprotectin and that sometimes will help you get it approved and covered. All right, sorry to interrupt there. Why don't we keep moving? No, no, absolutely. I think all very valid points. And I think in emphasizing that C. diff is so prevalent these days, we really should be checking for it, not only at diagnosis, but with any relapse of symptoms as well. And so not unusual in my practice, unfortunately, particularly when I'm first diagnosing someone the first time is, you know, when I, when you talk to her, she actually admits that she's actually had these, these symptoms for a long time but she has been fearful about coming to see the doctor, very concerned about what we may find. And you know, this is hard because delay in diagnosis certainly can affect outcomes for our patients. So what I'd like to move to now is we're gonna start with an audience response question. And I would like you um, to characterize what you think Ada's disease activity is based on how I just presented her case. And what we'll do is we'll have you fill in um, your response to this question now, but then we'll review all of the answers at the end. And so how would you characterize Ada's disease activity? Is it remission, mild, moderate to severe, fulminant, or don't know? 
Great. So I, I'd like to talk a little bit about this assessment of her um, disease activity. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that one of the things in the ACG guideline is that we really wanted to move beyond just activity, the symptoms of where the patient is right now, and really be able to incorporate other objective markers of disease severity that are actually very much linked to prognosis for that patient. And so by, by generating a newer activity index that we have here, it really, we think, will help you to classify your patients uh, to a greater extent and determine the right drug for the right patient based on this. And so, as you can see in this modified ACGUC activity index, one key aspect is that we're now defining remission. And so previously, this wasn't fully defined. What should we expect from remission? So a patient really should have formed stools. All of their clinical symptoms should be improved. And importantly, their biologic markers should be improved as well. So their fecal calprotactin should be less than the 150 to 200 range. We did leave a rather broad range there because uh, there's some variability in the literature in terms of what constitutes an elevated fecal calprotectin. But that from an endoscopy standpoint, we really should be, uh, a patient should have a, a subscore of zero or one on the Mayo, meaning completely healed or just very mild erythema to really be considered remission. The other key aspect to this activity index is that we've really uh, separated mild from moderate to severe. You know, previously drugs have been approved for mild to moderate or moderate to severe, and that moderate category kind of overlaps two areas. But I think it is really important that we can very much define mild, and once a patient has moved beyond mild, they are a moderate to severe patient. And so again, you can see these characteristics where we're starting to see a little bit more uh, an elevated fecal calprotectin, you know, an endoscopy subscore that really is one, not zero. Um, and the patient may have some increased symptoms, things like urgency or some intermittent blood and stool. And then things progress uh, to moderate to severe and fulminant, again, using this combination approach of not only their clinical symptoms, not only the how am I doing now, but also some of these markers of, um, uh, that, are, that are linked to prognosis associated with biologic inflammatory activity. We also really want to consider prognostic factors in ulcerative colitis, and, and these factors are actually linked to a patient's risk of uh, undergoing a colectomy. And so these are the patients we need to be most worried about, and these are the patients that we need to be potentially more aggressive in terms of their management up front. The more of these factors that a patient has, the much higher the risk for having a colectomy. So young patients, Patients with extensive colitis, meaning pan colitis rather than just left sided disease or proctitis, a more severe endoscopic score, so a Mayo score of three, where you're really seeing spontaneous hemorrhage when you uh, stick the scope in. If they're hospitalized, um, if they have an elevated CRP, a low albumin, or certainly co-infection with C. diff or cytomegalovirus. And, and I do wanna emphasize that oftentimes that infection, while certainly there and you wanna treat it, it's really a marker of a very sick colon and that there's you have to treat not only the infection, but also the inflammation from the ulcerative colitis as well. So if your patient has a number of these factors, this is someone who really has um, much more moderate to severe disease um, and, and fits in a category where we need to be aggressive with their management. So Millie, do you actually take patients through their um, prognostic factors? Do you talk to them a little bit about this when you're trying to manage them? I do, because I think they need to understand also that it's not all about the symptoms, because sometimes they say, you know, well, I'm only having five or six bowel movements a day. That's a little bit better than it was, or I'm not having blood with every bowel movement. But when they have the rest of these factors, you, you kind of can lay out the evidence why they have a much more severe disease and why their risk for colectomy is incredibly high unless we act now. So I think it's really important to share this with your patients. Yeah, I think this is critical because it's easy for us to sometimes lose the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just give another course of steroids because they respond to steroids, but we're forgetting that they've already had two um, recurrences of C. diff. Right. They've been in the hospital once, they were diagnosed uh, at age 22, and they've been struggling for four years already. Mm -hmm. And putting it all together is a very helpful thing to communicate to patients. And it shouldn't be when they're getting wheeled to the OR. It should be right. an ongoing dialogue so they understand that this is serious, of course, and that we want to try to get it under control. And that's why we're recommending certain therapies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So again, we now have, with the, the newer UC guidelines, evolving principles of UC treatment. And so we're incorporating elements of prognosis into both the diagnosis and the medical decision-making. 
And I would argue that we're moving beyond one size fits all to smart therapy for the right patient. And so this is a variation of precision medicine. While we don't yet have that specific genetic marker that'll tell us exactly the course of someone's disease, or uh, we have this, we have a number of factors that we know are associated with more complicated disease. And it is a form of precision medicine to apply this rubric to your patient and optimize their treatments instead of using guesswork. And I would argue too that another evolving principle is this role of really monitoring disease activity. And this, this speaks to one of David's questions earlier about pairing a fecal calprotectin with a scope at the time of, of active inflammation. So you know where that range is. There, the role of monitoring to achieve deeper remission and also to potentially anticipate flares and act proactively to treat those. Other updated goals, uh, again, I think the main take home point for me is really this, this diagnosis, including the extent of disease and biopsy with separating activity, how the patient is now and severity, which incorporates all of the prognostic factors and obviously the endoscopic and biologic components. That one of our goals is clearly induction of clinical response and remission as well as mucosal healing. And that we should really be initiating a maintenance therapy based on what we used at induction, what they responded to and their prognosis, as well as the fact that we certainly want to avoid any sort of steroids. Another aspect in the, the actually both guidelines is the role that uh, anxiety and depression play. This is a huge cofactor for so many of our patients. And I've really found that you can't just treat the biologic inflammation, you need to treat the whole patient and really being able to screen for anxiety and depression and either you don't necessarily have to treat them yourself, but get them hooked in um, with, with someone who can treat that anxiety and depression. It really helps to improve your UC outcomes as well. So I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Sure. Um, this uh, is, I think, very important. It's highlighted on your slide, and we sort, certainly highlighted it in the guidelines. But the practical question is, if we're considering uh, mental health disorders associated with IBD as sort of an extra intestinal manifestation or another dimension sure. to what we need to do, how do you screen your patients? And then do you have enough resources to refer them to the right people? If we ask, we need to do something about it. So what are you doing in your practice at UNC? Absolutely. So in our practice at UNC, we actually use two scales, uh, uh, the PHQ and the GAD. So you can get these generic scales. I, we actually don't ask about suicide on our screening questions, um, uh, but because we don't want that out there and not being acted upon, but we ask all the other components of these scales. And what it helps is I can see their numbers and I can see their trends and if they're getting worse and it triggers me to ask about it and address it. And, you know, uh, there are a number of resources here in our community. Uh, you know, luckily we do have something called a collaborative care model where we have a, a counselor who works with us, a, a psychiatry consultant. And so I will treat them myself um, with the psychiatry backup in terms of, you know, adding an SSRI if they need it or an SNRI. But certainly just even identifying someone in your community, um, you know, a psychiatrist that you can work with and refer to or a psychologist, I think it's so imperative because this has been a huge factor for my patients. Remember all the, when someone is depressed, they have a number of symptoms of physical symptoms as well, whether it's fatigue, whether it can even be abdominal pain. And so you're not going to get them better unless you address this as well. So I'll, I'll make a couple more comments because some of our colleagues are up uh posting questions to us, uh, and this is an area of interest to us as well. We're using a adaptive testing tool, which is something where the patient, while they're waiting, gets a link on their phone mm -hmm. where they um, can answer questions, and the, the tool knows how many questions to ask before it gets a reliable answer. Yeah, those are nice, these computerized models, so you don't have to ask Adverse. as many questions. So, um, and then what we found, of course, and no one's going to be surprised to hear, is that our patients have more anxiety and depression than we were realizing. Mm -hmm. You know, just basing it on your gestalt or if you have enough time to pay attention um, is not the way to do this. And uh, the obvious one as well is that it's related to disease activity. Uh, mm -hmm. This has been shown by others before that the more severe the disease, the more active the disease, the more they have these issues. Um, there's some intriguing new research to suggest that might be uh, not just behavioral, meaning that it's a result of not being able to function because of your bowel disease, but it might be driven by the microbiome being disrupted and the tryptophan and serotonin metabolites. So the idea of using an SSRI is right on there. Mm -hmm. And ultimately the work that needs to be done is to figure out is can we treat depression, anxiety, and IBD by fixing their inflammation and their mm -hmm. microbiome? 
Um, so lots of uh, interesting comments from our colleagues. The other one I want to just briefly mention is someone said, do you notice that our patients are more anxious or depressed because of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. um, and we had a study that we presented on this topic uh, more recently. I think it may be part of it is at ACG, but we actually found um, that they were less of the patients we were following longitudinally from before mm -hmm. the pandemic into the pandemic. We found that either they stayed the same or they actually got better. And we don't know exactly why that is. Maybe it's underpowered, but we also thought, well, maybe for some people, being in a home environment, working yeah. from home, not having to function in a social environment might have attributed contributed to that in some other way. I, I, I agree with you, David. We're seeing less as well. And when I ask my patients about it, they feel like they're able to eat healthier. They're not traveling. They're getting better sleep. Yeah. They're actually getting outside and walking. And more, most one of the most important things is they all tell me, well, I'm not now worried about going to have to run to the bathroom You know, at, at work. I, I can go. It's here in my house. And yeah. so I think a lot of anxiety has been relieved because of the work from home status. Yeah. So just someone asked that you repeat, you're using the generalized anxiety yes, uh, we, disorder mm -hmm. questionnaire and the PHQ-9. And we're using the PHQ-9, but we've made it an eight because um, we did not, you know, it's the sort of thing where one of the questions surrounds suicide and we didn't want that out there that someone responded that they were suicidal and that so if somehow we didn't act on it immediately. So instead what we do is we review it. And if someone is very depressed, we will in person ask them about suicide. Um, so that's just been our model. Uh, Ajua, if I could bring you into the conversation uh, briefly, are, are you in, in the practice there at Mass General? Are you guys doing some of this screening? So currently we're not screening as much for depressive disorders, but I definitely think it's something um, that is important, especially using something that's been validated like the PHQ-9, but making it an eight. Um, or something. Yeah. In our study with this adaptive tool, which of course we'll be happy to share more about um, uh, later, but there's even Twitter questions about this. I would just say that um, when we got IRB approval, we had to include the suicide question. And then we, it forced us, I think appropriately to make sure we had the right psychological right. resources available. So our colleagues in psychiatry, as well as some who are not at the University of Chicago, having a network of folks who are in the community that can support this right. um, had to be available and we communicated ahead of time to them. So this could be a whole symposium for a future right. conversation, right. but obviously we've uh, hit on something because there's lots of questions from our colleagues. Um, and I'll just add one more thing, which is that the slides will be available for download. You'll all be getting links to that for those who want the slides. And I appreciate that question too. So sorry, Millie, why don't you keep going? And oh, no, absolutely. This was a great, a great segue. And, you know, obviously I'm happy to answer questions offline about our collaborative care model, because I think that could be implemented more broadly as well. But in terms of prevention of complications, this is a real area of interest of mine as well from a research perspective. But you know, remember that by selecting a therapy for a patient, we can actually prevent either complications from that therapy. One example may be counseling on sunscreen use if you're starting a thiopurine to help to prevent downstream um, skin cancer. Or another example could even be treating their underlying inflammation from their colon by reducing that inflammatory activity, we reduce their dysplastic risk over time for developing colon cancer. So remember that each intervention we do, we can have, we can reap these downstream rewards and we can act early to prevent other complications, whether they be drug related or otherwise. And so this was an interesting study that I know David was a part of and Anita Afsali led um, out of Ohio State that looked at prolonged corticosteroid use. It was a, a survey that actually went to patients and providers. And what I pulled out here was the, the patient component because this was so incredibly striking to me. And so in this huge international survey, survey 76% of patients reported ever having been prescribed corticosteroids for IBD. And when you looked just in the past year, as you can see here, a vast majority of patients had had two months or more with nearly 20% having in the neighborhood of six months or more. And so really this is out there. Our patients are, are getting recurrent courses of, of corticosteroids and, and even ending up on longitudinal 
six months plus steroids. And this may be because they're getting prescriptions from various providers, um, but it's something we as their gastroenterologists need to be aware of. And I would really encourage you before you just write that steroid to really look back, how many courses have they had? It, it's very easy because the patient calls and asks for it. They say, I'll always respond to this. But I think we need to really try to limit this because of all the downstream complications associated with corticosteroid use. Yeah, this was a really interesting, I was part of this effort um, looking globally at patients and providers. And the other thing that came out of this survey was that the definitions of remission were very different. Uh, mm -hmm. Providers, maybe appropriately, were focused right. on objective measures of disease control and no bleeding, et cetera. And of course, patients are focused on feeling better and function. Right. And uh, the point of pointing out these differences, as obvious as some of them may seem, is to make sure we're communicating with our patients properly. Right. Absolutely. The other difference I saw, David, was that the, the patients came into starting a new therapy with a very different idea of how long that therapy might work. You know, I think we're also, you know, not doing a great job of communicating durability of therapies and ways we can try to maximize them and, and, and allow them to continue to work for longer periods. Yeah, well, Ajua is going to teach us all about communication. Uh, in a Perfect. Little, so we'll get back to that. But why don't we talk about the other one, which is mucosal healing? Yes. So, uh, you know, we've really evolved in our definition of mucosal healing. It's really now proposed as a composite of both endoscopy and histology. And in UC, uh, endoscopic healing can be defined as a really a return to a normal vascular pattern, the absence of the friability and the ulcerations that I showed you on our patient earlier, and normal or near normal, normal mucosal appearance. Because remember, it's really a zero or a one Mayo score that is considered um, remission. And certainly there's a, an, an evolving ta target of histology, which includes the absence of intraepithelial neutrophils. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on the histology aspect. And so one of the things we do know is that histology, if someone has histologic healing, that is an incredibly good prognostic indicator. They are much more likely to stay healed, to stay in remission. Histologically active disease is associated with a twofold increased risk of relapse. And, and really when these, there were two um, very nice net analyses that were published recently that looked at histologic features. And as you can see in this table, um, particularly things like neutrophilic infiltrate and crypt abscesses were really associated with an increased risk of relapse when present. However, I would like to emphasize that while we're starting to see the role this plays, remember that the efficacy of our agents is not such that we can necessarily use this as a target, meaning that if someone is endoscopically healed on therapy and they still have some histologic activity, I'm not changing their medication. That's still, they've met a goal. I obviously, hopefully at some point in the future, we'll be able to drive to a target like this, but given that there's so much variability in sampling, you know, we really need more data and we need better therapeutics to be able yeah, to use We don't it. even know the basics of whether histology and endoscopy line up in terms of timing right. response. So there's still some room to go, but when you get it, it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing, yeah. And less cancer risk. Right. All right. Well, Millie, that was awesome. Um, let's move into some treatments now, and I'm going to present the second case. Okay. This is Dennis. He's a 50-year-old man diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, uh, pan colitis, seven years ago after he quit smoking. So we all know that that is that subset of UC patients who present after they quit smoking. Uh, after some initial therapy, he ends up on infliximab, and dose escalated to 10 milligrams per kilogram every six weeks. So I'm sure that our experienced audience who's logged in tonight has patients who has needed this approach. Uh, and he's, despite that, now experiencing five to six bowel movements per day with nocturnal symptoms, uh, as well as urgency, which, uh, as Millie pointed out, is now in the ACG activity index because urgency drives patients crazy, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it wasn't in the original True Love and Wits criteria, and obviously seeing lots of blood. You assess him and you confirm that he has C, a C diff negative. His CRP is elevated, his albumin is low. And remember that that's a prognostic marker as well and probably indicates both the burden of inflammation as well as leaking protein. And in fact, when you assess an infliximab trough level, you're surprised to find there's lots of drug there and there's no anti-drug antibodies, no antibodies to infliximab. Colonoscopy is subsequently performed and confirms that he's pretty inflamed, as you can see in that photo there. So let me ask the audience how you'd like to treat this patient. So remember, he's on infliximab 10 mg per kg every six weeks, and he has a trough level of infliximab of 18, 
and is still quite severe and actively symptomatic. So your options, add azathioprine. Your next option is switch to a different anti-TNF, so cycle within the class. Switch to an anti-integrin, so the term is swap to a different mechanism. Switch to a JAK inhibitor, so you can swap to a different mechanism with a small molecule. Switch to anti-IL-1223, swap to a different mechanism with the uh, newer anti-P40 therapy, or you're not sure. So why don't you pick one of those? Maybe you've answered them by the time I got through reading. Mm -hmm. All right, and again, we're gonna come back to these later. So we're not gonna show you what the audience chose right now, um, but we will go back and we'll talk a little bit about some of the options at the end of the presentation today. So let's talk about how you approach loss of response to therapy. It's pretty straightforward in the way we should try to do this. Um, number one is to rule out infection. And let me throw in a COVID comment here. Um, many patients with COVID have digestive symptoms, but almost always when they have digestive symptoms, they have respiratory symptoms and fever. So as much as we might think that our IBD patient who's actively relapsing might have COVID and it's appropriate to rule out the coronavirus infection, it's um, not something that you should think too much about if they don't have other symptoms to support COVID. So rule out C. diff, consider whether you should evaluate for CMV. Then you wanna make sure they're really inflamed. Assess the inflammation and how active their disease is. Do their symptoms align with that? Now clearly in someone with UC with bleeding and frequency and urgency, those things align. Sometimes you might find that somebody has a functional overlap. They have persistent symptoms and to your surprise, they're not inflamed. Or if they have Crohn's, you know, they can have a fibrostenotic area with bacterial overgrowth or partial obstruction, and they're not inflamed. So you need to know that there's inflammation. The next step, of course, is to figure out is the drug where you think it is. And that starts by asking the patient if they've been adherent and persistent with their therapies. If they are, you also then want to know a little bit about the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics which is why in this setting, a reactive therapeutic drug monitoring approach was used. Reactive meaning he's losing response. We obtained a trough level and we assessed the drug. And then of course we address the acute symptoms and then we figure out, do we need to change our management strategy? So unfortunately, loss of response to therapies is a big issue. It's so common that I actually bring it up when I'm starting a therapy on a patient, not because I want them to be uh, pessimistic or depressed about their therapy, but to be realistic and to say, first, we need to make sure your treatment's going to work. And then we need to make sure it keeps working until we have something better to offer. And if you look at our pivotal trials in maintenance for our anti-TNFs, you can see consistently in these uh, clinical trials that there was almost a 50% loss of response defined as the patient needing a new therapy or a dose change by the end of the first year. So let me just ask in the real world, we can have a reality check. Uh, Millie and Ajua, do you see this loss of response in your own experiences? And I'm sure our colleagues out there are nodding their heads. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Very common. Okay, so you know we always wanna have a reality check against clinical trial data to make sure what we're seeing in the trials is something that translates to practice. So let's just review briefly what the therapies are that are available for the FDA, uh, by the FDA for moderate to, to severely active ulcerative colitis. You can see that we have the three anti-TNF therapies. Of course, the first one and the one that has the most data for hospitalized patients is infliximab. It also is the one that has uh, four biosimilars in the US that are available now. And then we have our two injectable therapies, adalimumab and golimumab. Then of course we have our anti-integrin therapy, vedolizumab. Recall that the way this therapy works is by inhibiting leukocyte trafficking from blood vessels into the gut mucosal uh, in, uh, area, the epithelial and subepithelial space. Uh, and then we have the first oral small molecule that's available in this uh, disease state, which is tofacitinib, which is a Janus kinase inhibitor. Small molecule means it's not a biologic. The molecule is small enough to be absorbed through the small intestinal lining. I actually take a minute to tell patients that biologics are delivered by injection or IV, not because they're more risky than other therapies, but rather because the molecule is so big, it can't be absorbed through the lining of the intestine. And separately, gastric acid would digest the proteins, although we could always work around that. It's just too big. So I explained to them why it has to be an injection or an intravenous infusion. 
And then the last therapy, the third class of biological treatments available for ulcerative colitis is ustekinumab. Ustekinumab is a monoclonal antibody that targets the P40 subunit that happens to exist in two cytokines, IL-12 and IL-23. So sometimes I say that you're actually hitting two birds with one stone. The stone is that P40, which is what the antibody hits, and the birds are the two cytokines that you knock off. And you can appreciate the list of different uh, adverse events that are here, but we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So let's look at what our options are for induction of remission for moderately to severely active UC. This is a combination of both the ACG guidelines, the AGA guidelines, as well as our colleagues in Europe and the ECHO guidelines for managing these patients. Of course, patients who have ulcerative colitis who are not responding to 5-aminosalicylic acid therapy should move on to oral steroids. And the options are, if it's moderate active UC, oral budesonide in the MMX preparation would be a reasonable option. And in general, we like budesonide because of its rapid clearance through the liver and lower uh, adverse event profile than systemic steroids. But if it's moderate to severe or the patient's not responding to the budesonide preparation, oral systemic corticosteroids are certainly reasonable. Then you also have options without using steroids, going directly to some of our therapies that have been approved and studied in this regard, including the anti-TNF therapies that I've already mentioned. Um, infliximab, when it's used based on the available data that I'll show you, is supposed to be combined with an immunomodulator and the data exists for azathioprine. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Uh, we also have the option of vetalizumab or ustekinumab or tofacitinib, uh, but now we know that tofa has to be positioned after anti-TNFs in the US and in other parts of the world. And if the patient has already been on anti-TNF, you have the remaining options available to you, veto or tofa or usta. It's recommended for induction to avoid thiopurines or methotrexate because thiopurines are slow to act and because methotrexate did not work in a recently published multi-center prospective randomized trial, as well as older data that also didn't work. So let's move on and talk about maintenance. In general, the way the patient does with your induction therapy will help define what your maintenance options are. So steroids, once again, as Millie pointed out, are not supported in maintenance. And how much steroids are you gonna let your patient have when they're in maintenance phase? In my practice, a single short course in a year is all I let them get away with. If they need more than that, or they're steroid dependent, I must find a new maintenance therapy for them. And remember that for patients who are not responding to anything else and are steroid dependent, that is another indication to consider surgery. Mm -hmm. Thiopurines are still an option and in many parts of the world, they're still used quite often. In my own practice, that's when people are really steroid responsive, like immediately steroid responsive, I might consider a thiopurine in maintenance, in general, more for the moderate patients. And it's recommended that methotrexate not be used as a primary therapy in maintenance. Another multi-center prospective randomized trial actually um, that was led at, by Millie's institution and Hans Herfarth uh, showed metho doesn't work in maintenance either. You can use anti-TNFs again for maintenance. You can use Vito, Tofa, or Usta, depending on your induction therapy, are all available and all demonstrate benefit. So if we move on, I'll just demonstrate to you the comparative effectiveness study called UC Success, in which patients who were naive to thiopurines and naive to anti-TNF were randomized to either drug alone or the two combined, just like what you may remember was the SONIC study in Crohn's. And combination therapy was superior to monotherapy uh, at a week 16 endpoint and subsequently looking at steroid-free clinical remission, which was quite important there. Uh, and moving on then, the other study that's of great importance to you, and you may have heard of it, was the first head-to-head -head biologic therapy study in ulcerative colitis. So patients here with moderate to severe UC were randomized to vetalizumab or to adalimumab at standard approved dosing. And the primary endpoint here was clinical remission at one year with a secondary endpoint of interest, which was endoscopic improvement. And what you can see in the varsity study uh, here was that the patients who received vetalizumab were more likely to achieve clinical remission than those who were on adalimumab 
they also were more likely to have that endoscopic improvement. And I can show you additional data where they actually were more likely to have histologic improvement with veto. It's of great interest to us, although there are some limits to interpreting varsity. One of them has to do with the fact that there was no dose escalation allowed. Uh, so we have to just keep that in mind. And the other is we haven't seen uh, the serum concentrations of the drugs to interpret a little bit more what might have been going on. What you can also see here is that they looked carefully at whether patients who were previously exposed to TNF inhibitors might have biased this because they were allowed as long as it wasn't to add alimumab. And in fact, in that analysis, that didn't change the uh, ultimate interpretation of the results. So this definitely suggests to us that from an efficacy point standpoint, Having a head-to-head -head trial like this certainly supports veto as your next option. We've also seen more recently, and this was presented at DDW, that combination therapy does not improve the rate of remission with veto and USTA. So unlike what I showed you with UC success, and again, this isn't the same design where patients were naive, but being on a combo therapy when you get to veto or USTA kinemab does not improve the likelihood of responding. And frankly, that's what was seen with anti-TNF in the early days too. In general, that's because patients stepped up through a thiopurine or in, in Crohn's methotrexate. And by the time they got to the biologic, that therapy wasn't adding anything. But separately is this issue that vetolizumab and ustekinumab have low immunogenicity and it doesn't seem to be needed. So most of the time now I'm using these therapies as monotherapy. Um, I could ask Millie, are you doing the same with your ustekinumab and vetolizumab patients? I am. I am using them as monotherapy with the exception, sometimes a, a patient may have a lot of joint um, extraintestinal manifestations that isn't fully managed by these agents. And so in those scenarios, I'll use methotrexate with it to help from the extraintestinal standpoint. Even but again, I'm not colitis. using it for primary efficacy. But even in ulcerative colitis? Even in ulcerative colitis, and if it's not linked to um, bowel inflammation, because it just does so well for peripheral joint inflammation. Yeah, I, I am as well. What dose are you using? Because I'm anticipating the question from our colleagues. Sure, absolutely. And so, you know, believe it or not, in RA, they use lower doses of methotrexate than we do. Remember that when we're using it for full dose in Crohn's disease, we're using 25 milligrams or so. And so really, if I'm just trying to get their joint pain under control, uh, or even frankly for immunogenicity, you can actually use more like 12 and a half to 15 milligrams once weekly, which tends to be a little bit better tolerated as well. But in this case, we don't worry so much about immunogenicity with vetalizumab. And right, just right, no, absolutely. I would, it, with a TNF, if you're using a, a methotrexate for immunogenicity, you could, you could use that lower dose. Sure. All right, great. Well, I'm going to keep moving along here. Um, so the next slide shows, actually the next three slides are just demonstrating something else we've learned. We knew this in Crohn's, but it's nice to also consider in UC, which is that patients who have not already failed other therapies are more likely to respond and remit when they get their first drug. Now, this may not be a biological principle. In other words, there's not something magic about having your TNF inhibited um, that leads to you not responding as well to the next agent. It may just be that patients who are selected out in the clinical trials, having already failed one drug, may be less likely to respond to the next drug or any drugs for that matter. Nonetheless, with vetalizumab, as you see here, the patients who have not been exposed to anti-TNF, who got the drug and were bio-naive, were more likely to achieve clinical remission than those who had already been exposed and failed therapy. Moving on to the next slide, you can see that similar findings occurred in the use to kinemab pivotal trials. Those who were anti-TNF naive were more likely to achieve clinical remission. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't work in the TNF failure population. In fact, uh, the studies were designed specifically to explore that, and it clearly works. Um, but it's important to keep this in mind because the main message we're trying to drive home is think carefully about which therapy you're going to use first and uh, know that this is more likely to work if you haven't already worked your way through others that may be less effective. Now, the next one shows you what tofacitinib is in the anti-TNF naive patients. Just remember, we can't do that anymore. The reason I chose to show you this slide was to say that when the FDA said it should be positioned after anti-TNF, they also set us up for having patients be less likely to respond to it, unfortunately. So if you recall with tofacitinib, it's dosed 10 milligrams twice daily for induction for eight weeks. 
And in maintenance phase, you can give five or 10 milligrams BID. And the new FDA guidance suggested you should try to dose reduce in the maintenance phase. Except when you looked at the TOFA pivotal trials, people who had already been on anti-TNF, which is what the FDA requires now, were more often needing 10 milligrams BID in maintenance, which by the way, I'm doing in almost all of my TOFA patients. I am too. Seeing very nice results. Uh, and we can get into a little bit more about why that might be, but I wanted to drive home this point that they sort of put us between a rock and a hard place, but we still have the drug available uh, and we're using it at that dose and having great success. And I think it has an important role for us to consider. We'll talk more about that, if not immediately, certainly when we get back to the Q&A uh, and review our post-test questions. Now, moving on, I just wanna emphasize a couple other things. We've started to see in large claims data analyses, and you probably have noted in your own practice, and I can tell you my surgeons have noticed because they've asked me, are you not referring us patients anymore? Yeah. Um, because our therapies have gotten better. And if you do a time trend analysis of therapy exposures over time and subsequent outcomes, one of which is colectomy, you can see that it looks like we're actually having a reduction in colectomy rates as patients have been exposed to biological therapies. In other words, with appropriate treatment of our patients, and I would argue that means achieving some degree of endoscopic improvement, we are changing the natural history of the disease. Disease modification has fully arrived in IBD, which of course rheumatologists were talking about for 20 years. And so then moving on, just thinking about whether we can do this with betalizumab and maintenance, you can appreciate the substantial mucosal healing, again defined as a Mayo score of zero or one. Um, and it also includes what happens when you give dose escalation of veto. It looks uh, across this uh, pivotal trial that there wasn't much difference between every four weeks and every eight weeks. I'll tell you that like all of our therapies in IBD in any class, some patients certainly need a bit more drug for different reasons. Okay, so I'm gonna ask um, Millie and Ajua now to talk uh, briefly about how they communicate about safety with therapies. Maybe Ajua, you could start us off since you're gonna then talk to us a little bit more about uh, communication. But when you're talking about biologic therapies, how do you communicate to patients about the safety of these agents? Sure. So whenever I'm talking um, to patients about biologic therapies or any therapy really, I first think about you know, some of their comorbidities, some of their, co their concerns and have a really open discussion with them. You know, a lot of patients now, they hear, they see these commercials on TV that list a million side effects and they come in and they have a ton of questions. So I try to be very honest with patients. I try to direct them, um, you know, to guidelines and data if there's any concerns. Um, but I really try to kind of, you know, do more so shared decision-making with the patient so we can come to an agreement together on what might be the best therapy. Yeah, I think that's great. That's best practice. Uh, by asking the patient about their concerns, you're gonna dig in a little bit about what they may have already heard or read or seen on TV. Um, and that also will help you directly address some of that. Millie, do you have any pearls about how you communicate about safety? Well, I think that one thing you certainly wanna use absolute numbers and make sure that you're, you're really communicating things accurately um, for the patient. But one of the things I also do is I really emphasize those risks that are potentially preventable and what the patient can do to help to avert those. So whether it may be appropriate vaccinations, maybe it would be um, you know, uh, supplementing um, vitamin D and optimizing levels. Maybe it's, as we talked about earlier, skin screening examinations or getting pap smears. But I have found that if people feel that they can take control of some aspect of that risk and reduce it, it helps them um, to kind of recognize that they have a little bit of control and that they're going to go into this with a, a better mindset. And, and I think really gauging where that patient is on the efficacy versus safety continuum can help you to be successful in having this discussion. Some people want really just want to feel better and want the best drug. Others are so cautious and fearful. And so you have to meet them where they are, as Adjua said, to help to select the therapy that they're going to be successful with. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that conversation that you're having with them. I want to say that I have a couple of comments about this. The first one is that the risk to benefit ratio as perceived by a patient changes over time. Mm -hmm. In other words, when a therapy starts working, the patient now is feeling better and their perception of the risks and the relative value of those compared to the benefit changes. And they may be willing to accept what they thought was risk previously, or they may actually think 
gosh, I'm doing so well and all those scary things I read about didn't happen to me right. and therefore they're gonna be more comfortable. So I always emphasize, as I mentioned earlier, that the first thing is we wanna make sure the drug is gonna work. So give us a chance to see if this achieves what we want. And the longer term concerns you may have, even if they're unfounded, but they're real to you, we're not gonna even need to talk about if the drug doesn't do anything because you're not gonna be on it. And if you're on it, we'll reevaluate mm -hmm. repeatedly as we go along. And the second point about this is that the one of the most significant adverse events that is a given in these patients with moderate to severe disease is that the untreated disease is an adverse event, right? right? We see that in patients who are on placebo arms of therapies where they are more likely to have adverse events usually associated with disease worsening than being on the therapy and communicating to the patient that the therapy benefits and risks must be considered in the context of their disease. Now you see this pyramid here that our friends Ben Click and Miguel Reguero have proposed. I wanna emphasize that this is not based on comparative um, safety data. This is based on their review across multiple studies and our general understanding that steroids repeatedly over all these years have been associated with worst outcomes, especially long-term. And both Vito and Usta look quite good in longer term follow-up. Remember, Usta has been around for psoriasis for years before it came to Crohn's and then UC. And Vito was in development for almost 20 years before it got to the market and remains a very safe option as well. But the, the least safe therapy is the one that's not working. So you have to have this dialogue with patients. And my last slide is putting this all together in a in slightly novel way. Um, this is a paper I would encourage our colleagues to read. I really loved it in CGH, uh, in which um, it uh, proposed a way to m assess the disease as well as the drug. So getting back to our patient Dennis here, who's losing response to infliximab, think ahead to how did we do this? Well, we assessed the activity of his disease in order to then make adjustments to his drug. Now you might say, well, that's common. That's how clinicians are operating in IBD. Yes, except that this paper emphasizes doing so before they're relapsing with the idea that the subclinical inflammation, by virtue of identifying that, it then becomes a reactive therapeutic drug monitoring approach rather than calling it proactive when in fact they actually had inflammation. So the algorithm looks a little complex there, but the bottom line is it has to do with having a monitoring strategy for patients and making sure that you're assessing disease activity with drug and then pulling them together. So we have a couple great questions from the audience and I'm gonna just try to get to a few of them before we go on to the learning objective number three. The first one I'm gonna throw out to Millie, why do patients who receive placebo in these pivotal trials for anti-TNF or frankly for any of our drugs do well? Why does anyone respond to placebo? Maybe start with the induction placebo patients, why would they respond? and then talk about maintenance. Why do we see some of these trials by design where, where there seems to be a placebo response? Well, I, I think this is one of the reasons why endpoints have changed over time um, in IBD trials. And remember that all, all of our the earlier drugs were approved on symptoms alone and symptoms don't always track with inflammation. Um, and so I do think that now that we've moved towards co-primary endpoints of symptoms, patient reported outcomes, and endoscopy, you will note that in all of the pivotal trials now, the rate of endoscopic placebo response is much lower than the rate of clinical symptom placebo response. But I also think it speaks to some unknowns about the disease and the disease course. I think there are a lot of ups and downs and that inflammation may come and go independent of our therapies. And that's what we're capturing some in that placebo rate. But I think that as we focus more on some of the biological forms of remission, it's gonna help us to understand a little bit better, more specifically, whether that drug treats inflammation. Absolutely. And remember that many of these studies in maintenance phase select out responders right. from induction. So, so it's really people lower. Got, <laughs> people got drug in, yeah. in the induction phase and then they get randomized to placebo and maintenance, which you could argue is unethical in some ways, um, but that's a carryover from the right. induction phase of the study design. Um, a, a, a thoughtful person out there said, don't forget about our incredibly smart and very valuable PharmDs. So I happen to work with an amazing uh, person, Shivani Patel, who I think has made a name for herself nationally, but I know there are many others out there who are helping us not just get our patients on therapies, but also on communicating to our patients about safety uh, and about 
uh, efficacy of therapies and helping us look for drug interactions and a variety of other things. So if you're fortunate enough to have uh, a colleague uh, who's a PharmD who can work with you, great. If you're looking for a specialty pharmacy that can support some of your needs uh, in private practice, there's many of them out there now, but you can also ask them if they'll help you with some of these other therapies. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked if I might go through my algorithm for our patient, Dennis, and I'm happy to do so, although we didn't have a CalPro for him because we had the colonoscopy. But in, in the case of Dennis, if you look back at my slide there um, at, at this algorithm, you can see that he actually was in the reactive monitoring phase because he was actively inflamed. We could backtrack and think that before he became symptomatic, let's say six months ago, we probably would have seen that his CalPro was elevated and he wouldn't have even known yet that he was gonna have a relapse. So if we had been more proactive in the disease monitoring, we would have identified it early. But in the case where we've had reactive monitoring with a colonoscopy that's uh, showing active disease, and then we assess his infliximab trough level and you saw that it was 18 without antibodies, you can follow the algorithm down all the way on the right there. And the recommendation would be to consider a different class of therapy which is what we're gonna talk about in the post-test question. In other words, he's got what we would consider to be plenty of drug there. He's already been dose escalated pretty high. Let's move to a different mechanism in this gentleman. So I appreciate that uh, somebody pointed that out and I think that's an excellent way for me to help um, explain it to the audience. And now you'll all get the post-test question right <laughs> because there's multiple answers that might be available. There are, I was gonna say there's um, more than one. Yeah, yep. and I have my preference uh, which we'll get to, and I, I don't want to bias everybody here, mm -hmm. but it's not to stay on infliximab, let's put it that way. All right, um, Ajua, uh, what is your experience with um, dose escalation with betalizumab? Can you share a little bit about that and how do you do it? Yeah, you know, so honestly, uh, patients with betalizumab that I have, you know, at every eight week dosing that aren't doing well, can always shorten the interval as well. So, you know, I might bring them down to every six weeks or every four weeks. Um, and, you know, a lot of times that can be helpful for them as well. Yeah. How many doses do you give it every four weeks before you decide it's working or not? That's a great question. Um, you know, I try to give it a decent amount of time. And, you know, I also like to follow the objective markers of inflammation as well. Um, if patients are having absolutely no benefit at all after about two months, I'm you know, scheduling their colonoscopy or doing a fecal calpro. But ideally you wanna wait like three months or so to look for objective markers of it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think three doses is, is really what you do with any dose adjustment. Um, and if they're not really recaptured by then, it's time to do something else. I agree, I would not go longer. You yeah. don't want the patient miserable. Um, I have seen that where people say, oh, we need to wait six, 12 months. But if that patient's not responding, you're gonna know it at three months. Sure. Um, I'm going to answer a couple questions about varsity. One person asked, why was there no dose escalation? Well, the reason there wasn't a dose escalation allowed in varsity is because they stayed on label for both drugs. Right. Uh, so that's the simple maybe cop-out answer, but that's why. Uh, the other question was, were patients allowed to be on steroids in varsity? And the answer is yes, and there wasn't a forced steroid taper. So if you actually adjusted for exposure to steroids, although the doses were pretty low by the end, especially in median, um, or other immunomodulators, by the way, um, the statistical difference between the two was lost, but that wasn't a uh, pre-specified endpoint of interest for that analysis. So it's important to know this, that with other therapies, maybe you can enhance the way these drugs work. And that's why I emphasize that that was a limit interpreting that. So I appreciate uh, thoughtful. David, uh, one, one thing that might be worth adding to that, though, is you know when, when the varsity results first came out for me, one of my first thoughts was, wow, in my clinical practice, I often have to dose titrate adalimumab. I wonder if that's a fair you know, comparison is what yeah, I was thinking. I mean, I think that that's probably right, except you and I uh, now know about- That's, the, yeah, we know about serene. serene. I was gonna have you tell them about Serene. Yeah, so Serene, just for our audience, in both UC and Crohn's was AbbVie-driven studies exploring, to their credit, um, dose uh, higher doses of adalimumab. So they actually induced with 320 milligrams followed by 160, and then kept them on higher doses versus the standard dosing. And with those higher doses, they did not demonstrate a difference in remission rates, even though they did confirm in this case with Serene that there were higher uh, drug concentrations present. 
-hmm. Now in the maintenance phase, there was some difference. And that might point out that after you get people over the initial hump, there may be some benefit. But uh, in induction, it didn't make much difference. So it's not necessarily true that more is always better. Right. I try to tell my kids that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, we're doing great. Um, we're going to get to more questions. There's a really thoughtful group of uh, folks who have joined us tonight, and I'm so delighted. Um, but let's move on now to the third learning objective. So we're going to switch gears a little bit, although we've entered into this conversation already, and talk about how to communicate with our patients. Uh, I think this is a truly important topic. Uh, and maybe more so now than ever in many different ways, not only because we have more therapies than ever, but I think society in general has become more attuned to some of our biases and some of the important uh, issues that have been raised. So I'm gonna hand this over to uh, Ajua to teach us a little bit about her patient, Sandra. Thank you, David. Um, so we're gonna be going through case three. Uh, so let's meet Sandra. So she's a 29 year old African-American woman who was recently diagnosed with moderate to severe UC. She's currently being seen by you in the outpatient clinic and she's on mesalamine 4.8 grams a day, as well as prednisone 60 milligrams, which she's been on for the past two weeks. So she's not doing well. Her symptoms are getting worse and you're having a discussion with her about stepping up her therapy. She shares with you her fear about biologic drugs causing cancer. So you can see the polling questions on your screen and you can vote now. So what would you in the office right now recommend to Sandra? Would you continue misalamine and do expectant management? Would you address her fears regarding cancer and discuss approaches together? Would you suggest a second opinion with a colleague? Would you discharge her from your practice? Or E, you're not sure. Please vote now and then we'll discuss the results a little bit later. Great. So here is a really helpful algorithm for dealing with patients who are concerned about the treatment options that you offer them. I think this approach can be really helpful in terms of um, maintaining that doctor-patient relationship that's so important, particularly in IBD. So whenever you have a patient like this, the first step is to, under, to understand the underlying reasons why they're concerned about the therapy that you're offering them. So if it's fear, you want to, and remember Sandra was fearful of biologic drugs, you want to acknowledge their fears and really address their concerns um, and understand why they're fearful of being on biologic drugs or other medications. If it's denial or misinformation, you want to educate the patient and correct misinformation and really direct them to credible sources, whether they be credible websites, uh, whether they're guidelines or studies, you really wanna make sure that they have accurate information to make an educated decision. And you know, it's never wrong for denial and misinformation to offer a second opinion with a colleague. Um, you know, whether a colleague is in your practice or it's a colleague, you know, outside of your practice, I think that's always a reasonable option as well uh, on the, for denial and misinformation. So Ajua, when we worked on this algorithm, Part of it also includes the patient who asks about trying a diet or some other treatment that we may not have as much evidence for. Um, have, do you have any experience with that or can you comment on it? Yeah, you know, I have some experience with that where, you know, patients have done all this research on the internet and they came in and they want to try some dietary therapies. And I think it really depends on the patient who's in front of you. So if you have a patient who is really sick, not doing well, and needs to step up their therapy, I think it's really important to have a discussion with that patient about the risks of doing only diet therapy when their bowel is super inflamed. Um, but I think it's really just about being open and honest and you know, making the patient feel like they're part of the team uh, yeah. and that they're playing an active role in the conversation. Completely agree. And, and sort of having a treat to target strategy, even when patients are using therapies that are not our conventional treatment options, uh, I think is a way to negotiate and work together. So that's wonderful. Okay, keep going. And actually I was gonna ask you a quick question. So you um, created this algorithm and I was wondering what prompted you to create it and how do you manage these patients in your Well, own? I did it with uh, your friend and one of our fellows, Noah Krugley at Cleveland, who's doing her advanced IBD year this year. Uh, but the reason we did this a few years ago is we saw a patient together who wanted to be on diet rather than any of our conventional treatment options. And uh, I said, I understand that you want to try this because it's a common question we have in colitis, especially, but frankly, in Crohn's, based on what we know in adults, um, diet doesn't seem to be successful at controlling your disease in a durable way. Uh, 
but it will make you feel better in the short term. So we negotiated and ultimately decided that we'd let the patient try the diet that they were try interested in, which was the specific carbohydrate diet. And uh, what we would do is assess the disease activity now and then reassess it six weeks after they did it. And we saw them back in the office and it was a great teaching moment for me with, with, uh, with Noah, because when the patient came back, they said that they were feeling better and they were sure they were gonna be better. Uh, but in fact, their calprotectin was higher in the follow-up. And yeah. they were of course disappointed. And I said, listen, you don't have to give up the diet if it's something you're enjoying and it's otherwise nutritious, but we clearly need to do something more to control your disease. So let's work together. And then that led to a discussion followed by a paper. So that's the, <laughs> that's the translation of what happens in the clinic and teaching into something else. Wonderful. Thanks for asking, letting me tell that story. Yeah, of course. Um, so back to this algorithm. So once you've picked a strategy that's helpful for the patient, you wanna have uh, you know, open discussion uh, about alternative options, uh, risks, benefits, and side effects. Uh, once you and the patient come to an agreement, you're now on the right side of the algorithm. Uh, and, you know, potentially the patient-doctor relationship is pre preserved and hopefully strengthened, ideally. You want to pick an objective target of disease activity and timing of follow-up. You want to follow up in short intervals with frequent uh, reassessment of the target. And then you want to assess, is the target reached? If yes, great, keep on going. If no, you want to go back to the left side of this algorithm at the bottom, continue discussing alternative options, and really engage in a shared uh, decision-making conversation with your patient. So now, there's a couple questions here about diet. If I could just stick to this topic for a minute and get both of you to comment. Um, uh, are you seeing or finding that more patients are going on dietary trials now because it's so easy to get that information off the internet? Absolutely. And oftentimes I've patients have seen a lot of this. Yeah. Patients Millie? have already tried them before. They what about came. North Carolina? Are you having this experience? I am. Um, and I think that one of the things you have to be really careful about is this is again a, an opportunity for collaborative care with a nutritionist or dietitian because sometimes my patients, they'll go on a very restrictive diet and they'll actually be so restrictive, they'll lose weight and it's not nutritious, but they feel better because they're not eating as much. And so just be very careful about kind of encouraging the, the if they want to try diet, if they can do it under professional guidance, it may help them to ensure they have appropriate caloric intake. Yeah, I mean, I really drive home that our goal is to make sure that they can live a, a good quality of life and enjoy food again. And so that's a really important Okay. So Ajo, why don't you keep going? Because we want to make sure we get to our post-test questions. Sounds good. So why don't we shift a little bit and talk about disparities in IBD care? So we see disparities in many different diseases. And unfortunately, IBD is not immune to disparities. For instance, Black patients with IBD have three times increased ratio of IBD hospitalizations and mortality in comparison to white and Hispanic patients. Uh, as well, that low, uh, patients with low socioeconomic status have an incidence rate of IBD hospitalization that's four times higher than those who are higher socioeconomic status. Uh, also, Black patients are less likely to receive preventive care in IBD, including DEXA scans, ophthalmologic examinations, flu vaccinations, and cervical cancer screening. And Black patients are less likely than white patients to be under the regular care of a gastroenterologist or an IBD specialist. And if we look at clinical trials, of course, we yeah. see they're predominantly in white patients. Yeah. So there's also a, a paucity of data to tell us whether they're more or less likely to respond to some of our treatments. Absolutely. And oftentimes race actually isn't even mentioned in some of the trials. All right, now let's talk a little bit about low socioeconomic status in IBD. So this is a population-based study out of Canada. It was about 10,000 patients. And it's really important to remember here that Canada has universal health care. So theoretically, everybody should be able to access the healthcare system. Uh, in this study, low socioeconomic status was, was associated with more use of any IBD medication except biologics. And it was also associated with worse outcomes like more hospitalizations, ICU admissions, uh, frequent high dose st uh, steroid usage, as well as higher mortality rates. Now let's talk a little bit about continuity of care in IBD. So this was a retrospective study out of the VA looking at about 20,000 US veterans across the nation. So in this study, a low level of continuity of care was associated with more surgery, more hospitalizations, and more corticosteroid usage. 
So now let's pause for a second. So in our earlier slide, we saw that black patients are less likely to be seen uh, by a gastroenterologist regularly. Now we see that continuity of care is associated with worse outcomes in IPD and low socioeconomic status as well is associated with worse outcomes. So it's really important to think about the patient in front of you, think about all of these factors and think about some of the barriers that they might be facing and how you can potentially intervene early. Ajua, one of our colleagues is asking, is this due to uh, biased delivery of care or is it due to lack of access to care? You know, that's a really interesting question. And we actually don't have any data looking at bias in IBD. Uh, I think it could be a combination of the two. For the um, Canadian study, it's obviously not an access issue because everybody has um, health insurance there. So that could theoretically be um, more of a bias issue, but it's not really discussed um, you know, in detail in the paper itself. In terms of the continuity of care in IBD, um, you know, not being under the regular care of a gastroenterologist or an IBD specialist in the US, well, at the VA, everybody has coverage as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it doesn't seem as much to be an access issue, but whether it's a bias issue, we don't have the information. Yeah, uh, I think it's important in Canada, it's sort of adjusted for uh, access, but still the patients were less likely to receive biologics. Mm -hmm. yeah. So certainly, and that was a socioeconomic status group compared to different racial groups. Yeah. Okay, keep going. All right. So now let's shift a little bit and talk about social support in IBD. So social support correlates with better self-management behaviors in IBD. Models that include patient and provider education and care management have success in improving patient outcomes. And case management to assist patients in navigating the healthcare system has shown benefits in improving care. And we've seen similar findings with patient navigation having an improvement in care, particularly in cancers like colorectal cancer or breast cancer. Now let's shift a little bit and talk about experiences of minority patients with IBD. Now I'm gonna say first that this is not specific to IBD, but you know, many of these are generalizable to minority patients who, who have interactions in the healthcare system in general. So they might face implicit bias. So implicit bias is defined as associations outside of the conscious awareness that lead to a negative evaluation of a person on the basis of irrelevant characteristics like their race or their gender. They might also have mistrust of the healthcare system. So this stems from decades of discrimination and exploitation of black patients at the hands of medical providers. So we obviously cannot talk about this in detail right now, but if you are interested in learning more about the historical nature of this, I would suggest that you read more about the Tuskegee syphilis study or you read the book Medical Apartheid. Those will both be helpful in giving you more of a background as to why some patients aren't trusting in the healthcare system. They also might experience stigma and racism. So both actual and perceived racism has been associated with negative health outcomes. So racism is associated with chronic stress. And remember, IBD patients already have stress and anxiety and they're already at risk for that. So it's associated with chronic stress, which has been tied to hypertension, preterm birth and low birth weight babies and black mothers, as well as increased mortality in older adults. So racism really has uh, an impact on patients and negative health outcomes overall. They might also experience lack of shared decision-making. So they might feel like their providers are speaking to them or at them or over them, but not necessarily with them. They might have delays in diagnoses where they're presenting over and over again with symptoms suggestive of IBD, but they're not receiving the appropriate workup. Or they might feel isolated. You know, They might not know other people who have their disease. They might not know people who get them or who see them or who understand what they're going through. Right now, there are no currently, uh, there's no patient support groups currently specifically for minority patients. Uh, and you know, those can be real sources of um, support and encouragement and seeing people who understand what you're going through. All right, now let's talk a little bit about implicit bias in healthcare professionals. So I'm gonna start by saying we all have biases. Healthcare professionals have the same level of bias as the general public. And I think what's really important is to, um, you know, first of all, take something like the implicit association test that can tell you a little bit about your biases, but also every time you're with a patient to think about, you know, how can my biases be playing a role here and really taking an active 
um, role in thinking about your bias, being aware, uh, and really being mindful, particularly when you're with particular patients about you know, how implicit bias can be um, affecting your interaction with that patient. So pro-white anti-black physician bias was associated with white patients feeling more respected by their physicians, but black patients felt less respected. They had lower levels of liking their providers. They were less willing to recommend their provider to someone else. And they felt that their visits were less collaborative overall. This physician bias was also associated with verbal dominance by the physician with black patients. And pro-white physician bias was associated with black patients being less likely to even fill their medications or less likely to adhere to your recommendations. And this probably stems uh, from not trusting their physicians because they know that their physicians feel a bias against them. Uh, and it's also important to note that for physicians and nurses, implicit attitudes vary greatly from explicit attitudes. So the implicit unconscious biases vary greatly from the you know, deliberate things that you think about and report. One of the questions we had here is specifically to me, how do I train my fellows and other faculty? Uh, and I'll just say that we have an academic skills retreat annually here. And this past year, we invited a speaker uh, from the university who specializes in educating about this topic to teach us about implicit bias. And then for our GI Grand Rounds for our faculty, and we invited all of our staff and nurses as well, we uh, had another, actually two individuals do an interactive presentation. Uh, so clearly learning about this and, and referring to some of the web resources is helpful. Okay. That's great. This is great, Ajua. Keep going. All right, so some strategies to empower patients to communicate about their preferences with you. So number one, focus on the present moment. So I think it's really important to ask uh, patients questions like, what matters to you? Or what are you most concerned about today? Or what's bothering you the most today? And oftentimes what the patients are the most concerned about are not necessarily things that we're the most concerned about. But I think it's really important to address their concerns and uh, make them feel like they're being heard. You also want to listen to what patients and caregivers say. You don't want to talk at them or over them or to them, but you really want to have conversations with them and really hear and listen to what they're saying and try to, try to address everything that they're concerned about. Uh, you want to ask situational questions. You want to provide information when and where it's needed. I will say that it's really important to speak slowly, to repeat things often, and to not use medical jargon when you're dealing with patients. A lot of times they'll act like they know exactly what you're talking about, but when they get home, they'll realize that maybe they didn't, or even in the room, they know that they don't, but they don't wanna tell you that they don't understand what you're saying. So I would say be clear, uh, repeat often, write out instructions, and try not to use medical jargon. And then you really wanna create a shared set of goals and check them off together at each appointment. So your patient knows that you guys are on a team and you're working towards um, the same endpoint. So uh, here's some digital tools to empower patients. So there are some decision aids like IBD and me, which generates a personalized therapy preferences report for patients to discuss with their physician. There are GI symptom trackers like my therapy or my IBD manager or my colitis, which help patients track their symptoms and share this information with their physician. There are other resources for minority patients. Uh, there's a new organization called the Color of Crohn's and Chronic Illness. So this is an organization that is specifically targeted towards minority patients with IBD. I wanna say that I work with this organization, but I don't receive any funding from them. I'm just very passionate about what their mission is. And they're actually launching the first patient support group for, patient, for minority patients with IBD, either in November or December. So you can join their, um, uh, you know, their listserv. Uh, and then visit CME Outfitters Gastroenterology Patient Hub to find these and additional resources to share with your patient. And I'm gonna pass it back over to David now. All right, yeah, I would, I would encourage folks to go to the CME Outfitters uh, Patient Hub where a lot of these resources we've covered today Maybe I can convince them as well to post access to the screening tools for mental health as oh, well. Oh yeah, that'd be great. All right, so I know everyone's been uh, excited to get back to our questions so that we could look at our post test and see how we're doing. So getting back to Millie's first case, sure. Ada, who is that 27 year old woman. Uh, Millie, take us through it and let's see what we got. Yes, of course. So remember Ada and she had really been postponing having symptoms for some time. And she's got uh, you know, reasonable clinical symptoms with the bleeding and the frequency and the urgency. 
And on a Mayo endoscopy sc score, she has a two and her fecal calprotectin is 183. So with that scenario, I'm gonna ask you one more time, how would you characterize her disease activity? Is she in remission? Does she have mild disease? Mild to mo or sorry, moderate to severe disease? Fulminant or I don't know. I don't think she's in remission. That is guaranteed. <laughs> All right, let's see how our audience did. Okay. Wonderful. We did. Millie, That's you're great. the best. Yes. Nice so job. obviously you all, the three is the correct answer for moderate to severe. And I think clearly taking into account that endoscopy and the, um, and the fecal calprotectin in combination with her symptoms, she really hits the level of moderate to severe severity. And so this is someone who you'd be thinking about that therapeutic menu that David reviewed in terms of treatment options. Fabulous, thanks. All right, let's move on. My case was Dennis, the 50 year old ex-smoker who was already on escalated dosing of infliximab and losing response. Remember that he uh, had an infliximab trough of 18 without antibodies uh, and that uh, ugly looking scope picture there with the Mayo 2 to 3. So let's get back to his question. What would you do next? Add azathioprine, switch to a different anti-TNF cycle, or swap to an anti-integrin, a JAK inhibitor, an anti-IL-1223, or you're, sure, you're still not sure. Diet is not the right answer. <laughs> I'm expecting 100% on this one, David. Hopefully. Well, I think I, I think there's some different options here, right? So we won't. Right. Oh, absolutely. 100% getting one of the options that is correct. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like people liked both the efficacy and maybe safety of an anti-integrin in this scenario, um, but I I think that uh, having people understand going to the the small molecule is an option because he's already been on the anti-TNF, as we emphasized. Um, being on the IL-1223 is certainly an option as well. Uh, and uh, fewer people said, I don't know at the end, which is really nice for us to see. Hopefully we're getting you to move to the right direction. Adding AZA in this scenario is unlikely to be strong enough to do something. There is a little bit to say, well, AZA might raise the infliximab level even more, but I'm not sure we're gonna get much more out of that uh, in terms of squeezing juice out of the lemon there. David, so could I press you? Which of these would you choose? Um, I, I probably would go to um, Vito. Uh, it depends on my conversation with the patient. Uh, the reason I might choose tofacitinib here is because mm -hmm. of that low albumin, and I like yep. the small molecule. But I've already seen that despite the low albumin, he had lots of infliximab present. Mm -hmm. So he may not be clearing the drug too rapidly. So if I do Vito, I would give him loading doses and reassess early. Mm -hmm. um, usually at week six, I do that even in, during the loading phase. Uh, and if I was to consider TOFA, uh, I would probably um, want to know if he's doing better within two weeks. Mm -hmm. So a couple options. I think that if you're thinking TOFA, you also have to think about risks uh, for related to his uh, knowing his lipids up front and knowing whether or not he has any other risks for thromboembolic complications. Although I, I keep telling everyone we haven't seen that in the UC population right. yet. So I don't worry too much about it. It's a good question. What about you? What would you do here? I, I, I also was thinking TOFA because of the low albumin and the pretty yeah. rapid onset um, of action potentially. Um, right. You know, obviously we do have to think he's got a lot of infliximab in his system right now, right? And so yeah. you are, he will still have that in his system when we start the next agent. And so I, I probably would not start steroids and TOFA and have that high infliximab in there. Um, I would be thinking a little bit about um, safety, but yeah, I, mean, I, I think, think that any of those point. three options would be good. The anti-integrin, the JAK, or the Instagram app. You don't want to be stacking your immune therapies if no. you avoid it too. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting case. This is a real patient of mine, by the way. So in the in the world that we were treating him, he actually did go to Vito, which is why I chose the case because I wanted to get that out there. Mm -hmm. All right, very good, thank you. Uh, and the third case was Sandra. and. Uh, Ajua, remind us about Sandra and what the options were. Yes. So remember, Sandra was a 29-year-old African-American woman who was recently diagnosed with moderate to severe UC. She's currently on mesalamine, 4.8 grams a day, and prednisone for two weeks. Not doing well. Symptoms are getting worse. You're talking about stepping up her therapy, but she's concerned about biologics causing cancer. Let's see what the audience chose. So what would you recommend to Sandra? Continue mesalamine and do expectant management. 
Or would you address her fears regarding cancer and discuss approaches together? Suggest a second opinion with a colleague? Discharge her from your practice or you're not sure? Okay, well, hey, so look at that, 100%, wow. Looks like wow. on your done. first symposium, you already got a, a, champ, a champagne. You never see that. A champagne cap. Right. Remember those LPs when we got no red blood cells? This is Ajua's yeah. first symposium. <laughs> okay, exactly. It only goes down from here, Ajua. No. <laughs> but in all honesty, what about suggesting a second opinion? Is that ever useful in these scenarios? You know, I think suggesting a second opinion is never a, a wrong option. I think here you can really have an open discussion and acknowledge um, your patient's fears, kind of going back to that algorithm like we mentioned. Uh, in the algorithm, the denial and misinformation were more of the second opinion option. But really, I think it's always reasonable to offer your patient a second opinion, even if she just wants to talk with somebody else, hear their perspectives, or hear it a second time. This, this was such a great discussion, guys. Uh, honestly, between talking a little bit more about mental health, the newer goals, disease monitoring, and then the whole discussion about shared decision and healthcare disparities, really new information for our colleagues out there. And I'm getting lots of comments through the question tab that people have enjoyed it. So I wanna thank both Millie and Ajua, and I'm gonna provide these four SMART goals to give our audience from today's program. First of all, remember to differentiate activity from severity or prognosis in your choice of therapies for ulcerative colitis. Choose your therapy based on how sick they are, their prognosis, the, the extent of their inflammation, and also think a little bit about what that patient's specific issues might be in terms of which treatment you're gonna sequence first. That also may include your discussion with them about safety, about extraintestinal manifestations, all the other things that we've tried to cover uh, during tonight's program. We also wanna keep in mind focusing on therapies like the budesonide before we get to systemic steroids and therapies that are uh, more selective in their onset before more systemic immunosuppressive therapies. And lastly, I think we've opened our eyes a little bit tonight and I'm sure we all have more work to do in this area, but try to understand the role of implicit bias the culturally competent and sensitive care that we need to try to provide to our diverse patient populations uh, and learn a bit more about uh, shared decision-making and engaging your patient in this process. You can meet them halfway. You can negotiate an ongoing sort of baby steps approach to getting through therapies together and you can build trust by doing so. So we got lots of questions and I went through as many as I could and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but I want to just remind you that you can get credit for today's program, and the program will also be available for enduring through the website. So to receive CME or CE credit, click on the Evaluations tab. It's really important to us because we want to learn from you. How can we improve and how can we do this in the future? Uh, and we want you to complete that post-test, and then you can just print your certificate. So a nice thing about being at home is you can just print it right out there um, or send it to someone to print for you. As a reminder, if you'd like to claim this activity as a CME for MIPS improvement activity, follow the steps described on this slide. So uh, it's uh, all outlined here, and I bet those who need MIPS actually know how to do it already. But complete the activity post-test and the evaluation over the next 90 days. Do something to change your practice. We've given you lots of ideas today. And then complete the follow-up survey that CME Outfitters sends you in three months. Please do that. Three months. Don't delete the email. Fill it out. We really want it. Uh, so I want to remind you to visit the cmeoutfitters.com website, and you can see this presentation and others. I want to especially thank my panel, both um, Millie Long and Ajua Yaboe, as well as thank all of you for joining us uh, late at night. Maybe you've been at ACG or working all day. Uh, and I want to thank CME Outfitters for their assistance in developing today's program. This was uh, a unique program. I really enjoyed it. And I want to wish everyone staying safe. Uh, vote. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully soon. Thank you.